podcast and occasionally other podcasts i'm one of your co-hosts charles skaggs back in ghostwood forest once again trying to lift everyone's spirits as zane and i are getting back to the david lynch after a six episode retrospective of x files and so of course i'm joined by my wonderful co-host wonderful friend and soon to be alcoholic enabler zan sprouse how you doing zan I'm doing excellent, Charles. Thank you for that introduction. And I find it interesting that you are going to lift everyone's spirits with our movie today because... Well, that's a good point. (laughs) I mean, my God. (laughs) Well, considering the state of our post-election here in the United States... Where we have no president yet? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we're... Uh Just to give everybody a heads up of where we are as we record this, it's November 5th, 2020... Two days after the United States presidential election, we still currently have no declared have no president. president. So maybe, you know, the elephant man might actually be a step up. Yeah, there's that's I mean, which at least, is a very disturbing thought, right? At least the elephant man is a story about how we should treat people regardless of how they look or where they came from. <laughs> And I would like to take this opportunity to apologize to the rest of the world that this race is so close. It should have been a landslide, and I'm sorry that it wasn't. But unfortunately, half of our country is half of our country, if you get my meaning here. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, uh uh-huh. But we're going to try to hopefully set that aside for just a little bit, because we want to concentrate on something that we enjoy. And one of the things that Zan and I obviously both enjoy, David Lynch films, right? Heck yeah. And this one in particular is one of Zane's favorites, as I recall. Mm-hmm. So uh, here at episode 87, we are, of course, talking The Elephant Man. The The Elephant Man, which just, this, just two months ago was released on Criterion Blu-ray, which is the first time this has been on a digital format in the United States region in quite a while. Yeah. Yeah, we have it. This just came out, uh, the Criterion Collection edition, which obviously we're going to be talking more of next time as we go through the special features. But this one just came out on September 29th, 2020. This was in a new spiffy 4K transfer mm-hmm. of 2.35 to 1 ratio goodness. It is gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Yeah. And obviously it's a black and white film, and it was from 1980, so there's only so much you could do with the video, I'm presuming. But it still looks great on the on blue. True. I mean, and it's, I mean, that's only 40 years ago, Charles. It's not like it's, you know, silver nitrate that's going to catch on fire. No, I agree. Granted, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is not Inglorious Bastards, people. <laughs> True. 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 I just, yeah. um, I, I don't. I don't like I don't like thinking about movies that are n- younger than me as needing some sort of restoration project that's funded by <laughs> well I wasn't the, trying to you know by the John D and Catherine T MacArthur Foundation or something like that. I mean I am older than you, so you know it's not like I was trying to imply otherwise. But I understand, but we are both older than the Elephant Man movie, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's not a good so luck, but there, you know. So there's that. I mean, it is what it is, right? We got that going for us, which is nice. Which is nice. Which is nice. So, so yeah, the Elephant Man originally came out on October 10th, 1980, and was a historical drama film, of course, adapted by Christopher Devore, Eric Berggren, and of course David Lynch. Directed by David Lynch, produced by Jonathan Sanger, and most interestingly, Mel Brooks. Well, there are two. Mel Brooks connections in this movie. Yes, there are. Like, oh, hey, a certain Anne Bancroft we'll talk about. 
Yeah, some uh, some chick, some Mrs. chicky nose. Yeah, Mrs. Millbrooks, exactly. And uh, composer John Morris. Yes, and that's obviously something we, we will talk about as well. Mm-hmm. Who composed the score for this film? He did, and uh, composed quite a bit of Mel Brooks's films. Yes. This one, obviously, it was very acclaimed. It received eight Academy Award nominations. How many did it win, Charles? Well... Get out the calculator. Let's just say zero. And that's on you, Academy. And if there's anybody out there who is also a listener of Gold of Gold Standard, first of all, I thank you. Second yes. of all, I apologize that you're going to hear this rant from me twice <laughs> <laughs> about what the hell is wrong with the Academy. You're just reinforcing it. That's all. I know. I'm just re- I'm just reinforcing it. Yeah. So the Elephant Man nominated for Best Picture, Best Director for David Lynch, who lost to Robert mm-hmm. Redford for Ordinary People of all things. Okay, now don't get me wrong. Yes. Ordinary People is a fantastic movie. Right. Suicide is never the answer. There's always help. Yeah. Um uh yeah, no. It's but it's a very you're just kind of it it's it, it doesn't have the atmospheric beauty of this movie. Yeah. Other things that were up were things like Raging Bull. Right. Scorsese. So, you know. Which is also It probably would have lost to that if it hadn't lost to Ordinary People. Yeah. Richard Rush for Stuntman and Roman Polanski for Tess. And if he doesn't win Oscars, I'm fine with that. Yeah. (laughs) I think we're all fine with that. Yeah. we could. If Roman Polanski never did anything else in Hollywood, I'm sure we would all be very, very happy think I think we'd be fine. We can just. We're cool with that. We can listen to our soundtrack of Chinatown because Jerry Goldsmith is, am- is amazing, and then we can end with that. I Personally, I think when we're talking about director in this one, the, the contest was between David Lynch and Martin Scorsese. And they – and interestingly enough, these were both black and white movies, mm-hmm. both beautifully shot of disgusting subject matter. True. I don't know if you've seen Raging Bull, Charles, but it is one of the – it's been a very, very, very long time since I. It is one of the bloodiest movies I've ever seen, and I watch a lot of horror movies. Yeah. Um, and just like, just like Elephant Man, where it's this gorgeous movie, but it's like 1880s England. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is exactly. 1880s London, which is gross. Yeah. And David Lynch does a good job of making it gross, but there's an atmospheric beauty to it that we all know is David Lynch's. Forte. Mastery. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. And of course, uh, best actor nod for John Hurt, Sir John Hurt. Nothing against De Niro, but John Hurt, I would think, would have taken this one, in my in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Best original score, of course, for John Morris. Best adapted screenplay, best costume design, best art direction, and best film editing. And see, one, here's, none of here's, those. One, none of those. And best original score... This is a tough one for me because we know what else came out in 1980, which was Return – not Return of Jedi. I'm sorry. Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> Empire, Empire Strikes, Strikes Back. Back. Yes. Which gives us the Imperial March. Yes. Which is the greatest – In the asteroid uh, field. The second greatest piece of music written for Star Wars yes. is the Imperial March. Yes, it The is. first greatest is when Luke is watching the binary sunset. Let's see. I, I, would, I would put the star, original Star Wars theme, you know, the main title theme. Above that, because it's iconic. It is, it is iconic, but but as a, as a, as music, as as a, as a I, I get where you're coming from because it is beautiful. There's such a melancholy Sadness. beauty to that piece, and I think the Imperial March is as iconic as the Star Wars theme. It is. It is. So also, um, Altered States was up. Ex- excellent Cronenberg. Excellent right? film. Yeah. No, Altered States is not Cronenberg, and I can't think of who it is. Oh, I would have thought it would have been him. I, I'm... Yeah, who is Altered States? I can't think off the top of my head. That's right. You just have to. We still need the looking up music. Uh, oh, it's duh. It's Ken Russell. God. Oh, it's, okay. Uh, Zan, what's what? Who directed that movie where it's twenty minutes of nothing but naked people? Yeah, it's probably Ken Russell. <laughs> um, uh, but the winner of best original score, yeah. was was the soundtrack to Fame. Okay. And as much as I love Michael and Leslie Gore, uh, uh-uh. no, I, I, I don't, I don't think so. Nothing against Irene Cara, but I don't think so. Yeah, I want to live forever. Yeah, 
I'm gonna learn how to fly. Theme. Anyway, um, but we have to talk about the Oscar that it did not even get nominated for because, because there was because no there wasn't one. Yeah, so, there wasn't one. Yeah, so apparently after receiving a ton of criticism for yes. failing to honor the film's makeup effects, Christopher he, Tucker, who did a phenomenal job and who worked on Star Wars, I Claudius, all kinds of things that you've seen before. Yeah. Um, this and you know what's you know what is surprising. Charles. Yes. To me is that it's this movie and not American Werewolf in London that created this that created this category. Yeah, you would think, right? That's yeah, it's true. So the Academy right. so the, the Academy Award, the Academy for of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, they finally just got off their ass and created the Academy Award for base, best makeup and hairstyling the following year. Mhm. So And the too little, too late, but yeah, and you know, here's well, one in the following year was American World Within London. Ah. So it's nice that. So was that the first one to win the, win the award? That was, that was the first one to win the award. Yes. Wow. Um, there was an honorary. There were honorary Oscars in the '60s for the Seven Faces of Doctor Lau and Planet of the Apes. For okay. I, and I don't remember what they were called. They were like honorary, um, like a special achievement, something kind special of... achievement in makeup effects or something like that. I don't yeah. remember exactly what they were, but the but the very first winner of best makeup was American Werewolf in London, and it was Rick Baker. Okay. Um, and we have Christopher Tucker to thank for this because we've all seen John Hurt in a million things. Yes. You cannot tell it's him, and it's it's not like he's unrecognizable. Yes. He's unrecognizable, and it's 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 not like one of those where the actor said, "I still want to kind of look like me." No, they they went f- full on with this, and this makeup job is in, is incredible. And yeah, I've got some trivia about the makeup. Yeah, and, and that's the thing about, about yeah Joseph Merrick. Nobody is one hundred percent sure what his condition was. Um, there were, um, I've got some trivia on that too, if you're interested. Yeah. So in, apparently in 1986, they, yeah, they, they don't know the exact cause. Like you said, in 1986, yeah. they, it was conjectured that he had Proteus syndrome, Proteus syndrome after like a uh, fibrous dysplasia, uh, neurofibromatosis. They had all of these, conjectures over the yeah. over about a hundred years and then in 1986 they figured this is probably proteus syndrome because it has everything it has um the the wart growth on the skin but they're not discolored it has the bone growth and not necessarily starting from birth because he didn't start to disfigure until he was almost a teenager it was around like 12 or 12 yeah yeah it was around puberty when this happened to him so you know, we're not 100% sure what happened to him. And he died in 1890. So we're not. He wasn't that uh, old. No. No, he wasn't that old. And we're also not talking about tons of photography happening at this time. Yeah. You know, what we have are a few photos and his skeleton. Yeah. Well, apparently they did DNA tests on his hair and bones in 2003. But mm-hmm. those were inconclusive, right? He was too it, he was too degraded, yeah, uh, for those to be able to be. But yeah, based on what we know, we think that what he had was Proteus syndrome. Yeah, and Proteus syndrome is, and I and we've talked about this before. I think it is incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, there's only been a little over two hundred cases. Yeah. ever confirmed of Proteus syndrome. So this is not, this is not a common, this is not a common thing. And because of the nature of this, it's not like you have something that makes you, that that's obviously Proteus syndrome. This is, a dis, you know, the, the disorder of how your bone growth is out of whack Right. No two people with Proteus syndrome are going to look the same or have the same attributes. Yeah. So um, 
So since we're on the topic of quote unquote John Merrick, should we go uh-huh. ahead and re- should we go ahead and run down some more details about quote unquote John Merrick for, and the, for the, our listeners? Yes, and you know this is one thing that I actually credit David Lynch for. Okay. By referring to him as John Merrick in this movie is he he uh, Joseph Merrick when he was younger he had an attempt at surgery on his mouth and it didn't help at all and so for him being the sideshow curiosity that he was and trying and, and basically being a, a you know a visual performer yes not needing to talk it was and people couldn't understand him so he didn't talk very much um when he was first found by Dr. Treves he mistakenly identified him as John Merrick and actually Joseph Merrick do, did have a stepbrother named John yeah yeah, his real name but, is actually Joseph Carey Merrick, by the way. Right. He's, his real name is actually Joseph. And in David Lynch's movie, he's called John throughout the movie because for whatever reason, Frederick Treves refused to call him anything else. Yeah. I don't and, know why. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And the, it, when, when, when they wrote, wrote the script, book. Yeah, they wrote, basically when they wrote this script, it was, um, it was adapted from um, – uh, his Treves's um, accounts, you know, his his right. his uh, his journal and um, and, uh, you know, and then there was there was another book uh, which I wrote down. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? OK. Yeah. So it was. Um, yeah, it was it was from Treves's book, The Elephant Man and Other Reminisces from 1923. And then there was another book, uh, The Elephant Man. A Study in Human Dignity by Ashley Montague. Montague. Yeah, prob- and even, Montague, even, in each, even Ashley Montague, just for whatever reason, you know, was able to point out some inconsistencies of what was going on with Joseph Merrick about how he doesn't – he didn't know about his mother or whatever – he he did clear up some inconsistencies, but he still insisted on calling him John Merrick, and I don't know what the, what that's all about. Right. It's like it's like these these doctors were just dead set on dead naming him for some reason. I don't know what was going <laughs> unless, on. But... Unless he just went by that nickname, I don't know. But it, I believe it was a misunderstanding that if he if Joseph Merrick was anything like the character as John Hurt portrayed him. Mm-hmm. He was probably just too polite to correct them. Maybe. It's certainly possible. Yeah. Joseph Carey Merrick is his actual name. Yeah. And he was born in Leicester and began to develop abnormally at 12. Mm -hmm. His mother died when he was 11 and his father soon remarried. But, of course, he was rejected by his father and his stepmother. To a a bitch. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. So he left home and then he went to live with his uncle, Charles Merrick. Right. And, right. and it, go ahead. And that's that's who got him hooked up with the. Well, there was a yeah. S- sideshow management. <laughs> yeah, because because basically, yeah, like this time is like roughly about 1879, he's 17 years old. Mm-hmm. And so he goes to work for the, the Lester uh, Union Workhouse. And then, like five years later, after that, he gets he contacts he contacts a showman named Sam Tor, and proposed that Tor should exhibit him. Right, because he, after a while, he had a deformity in one of his hands. Right, and you know he started out work uh, rolling cigars, and he just did not have the dexterity for it after a while. So he had, and they even say this in this movie: How else is he going to? Earn a living. Have a have a livelihood. Yeah, this yeah, is this yeah. is all he had at the time. Yeah. Um because he And keep in mind this is nineteenth century England. So yeah, this, is, this is not jobs weren't exactly plentiful at this point. This is around Jack the Ripper era, just a little before yeah. Jack the Ripper comes onto the scene. Right. right. So we're talking Sherlock right. Holmes period. 
here, by the way. Yeah. Right. So he was he he Victorian spent England. some time Victorian England. Yeah, he spent some time, you know, hawking various wares, you know, you know, from yeah, you know, from haberdashery to cigars to whatever he could. He was just trying to um hawk whatever he could in the streets, but it's kind of difficult when you have a disorder such as he did and you are living in a culture like Victorian England where tolerance is not exactly a thing. No. And so it's difficult for you to be seen in the daylight and have anybody want to buy anything from you when you're being called a monster and what is it the, what is it the um the doctor says in his letter to the to the london times that uh, women and nervous people should steer clear <laughs> right. yeah. so so if you so thought social, of, if you thought yeah. social acceptance was bad now imagine in 1890 <laughs> imagine like yeah. 1877 yes. yeah. london yeah it's even worse <laughs> yeah um so apparently um the Sam Tor guy arranged for a group of guys to manage Merrick, mm-hmm. who, and that's where he got his name, the Elephant Man. That's where he got the name of the Elephant Man, and this is one of the things that's in the movie that is um, not necessarily true. Right. Um, the Freddie Jones character, yeah. I think, is an amalgam of all of this management. Um, there's not a ton of evidence that he was as mistreated as Freddie Jones mistreated him. Yeah. But there were a lot of there was a lot of management going on of sideshow performances until eventually people wised up and sideshows were seen as in bad taste. Yeah. So now doesn't have the dexterity to work in the workhouse. Nobody wants to buy his hawked wares and there are no sideshows anymore. (laughs) So he's quickly losing abilities to make a living. Yeah. So, so he, after touring the East Midlands, he goes to London and he gets exhibited in a penny gaff shop rented by a showman named Tom Norman. And mm-hmm. Tom Norman, this guy, is the main basis for Mr. Bites. Right. Right. In the movie. So, um, and then it's here, Norman's shop, that gets visited where Frederick Trees shows up and, and, and sees and encounters Merrick for the first time. Let's talk about Anthony Hopkins for a minute. Yes. In this will. scene. Yeah. Um, Anthony Hopkins. There's there's a scene where Anthony Hopkins, he, he pays for a private showing. I know we're kind of jumping and, back and forth between the factual stuff and the movie, but yeah. Well, I don't, I don't care if you don't care. <laughs> I don't. Uh, it's not my fault. It's the listeners. who. who I just, I'm just trying to, put, the, I'm just trying to put it in, in its proper context. That's all. Right. I, and I just, I, th- I thought this might be a good way for us to, to, to talk segway, a little bit segway. about the movie. We could, yeah, seg- yeah we between seg- the two, we can segue. Yeah. The, the scene where he has his private showing to see the Elephant Man, Anthony Hopkins just freaking kills it because this, this is uncut, where you see, you don't see him, you don't see John Hurt at all. You see Anthony Hopkins, and you see. You can tell that the light changes, so you can tell that a curtain's open, mm-hmm. and Anthony Hopkins just stands there, and without any cutting to put drops in his eyes or anything like that, he just his eyes fill with tears. Yeah, it's it was really gr- it was masterful direction by Lynch because he does this great close up on Hopkins' face, and the look that, that you know he's just staring in awe, and he can't believe the cruelty of what has been inflicted on John Merrick as he right. watches as he watches him right and it's and it's this look of fascination and fear and horror and empathy look, and look, sadness and Anthony Hopkins just like I said just kills it he does because he just you can see it all in his eyes in this one shot where there's no cutting where his eyes are just they're fascinated and then they just well up with tears and then they just the tears just fall down his face. Yeah. It's it's that that should have gotten him best actor those Pretty much, yes. 18 seconds <laughs> should have done that in my yeah. opinion. Acting. Yes. Exactly. So, um do you want to continue with the movie or do you want to get back to the uh the true no, let's, story? Let, let's get back to the to the life of uh Joseph yeah. Merrick and then we can we can pepper in some uh some highlights of the movie and then sounds, we can talk more about the movie. Sounds yeah. Good. All right. So, um, 
So after Merrick was displayed by Treves at the Pathological Society of London in 1883, mm-hmm. Norman's shop gets closed by the cops, by the Popo, and Merrick – By the joined, Bobbies. By the Bobbies, yeah. Uh, and Merrick joins Sam Roper's circus and was toured in Europe. And it's here in Belgium, which gets shown later in the movie. Right, right. But in the in, in the in the true story, supposedly, Merrick was robbed by his road manager and abandoned in Brussels. Abandoned in Brussels with literally no money. Yeah. But he eventually and gets back all the way to the so, all the way back to the London hospital. Where he stays for the rest of his life. He gets back to London and he's not doing well because not only Yeah. Not only is Proteus syndrome degenerative, mm-hmm. he also has a heart condition. Yeah, that is being exacerbated by bad living conditions, which essentially is Europe in the eighteen. Yeah, in pretty the much. 1880s. It's like, it was, It's called. Sorry about your luck, but you're living in in Europe in the nineteenth century. Yeah, and Europe in the nineteenth century was not a clean place. I mean, nowhere in the nineteenth century was particularly clean we were on the cusp of the industrial revolution so if it's not you're everybody's breathing pure coal practically yeah if it's not coal slag or horse poop mm-hmm. or or rats or whatever right. i mean it's not a cleanly place so no all of his issues are being exacerbated so he finally makes it back to london in the scene that we see in the movie where he's he gets chased into the toilets by people looking at him and he yeah. freaks out on him as well he should. But the cops find him and they fish out Dr. Treves's card. Yeah. And that's how they get him back to the hospital is because there's no other – he's having a hard time talking because he has such – you know, as, as we have – as we saw earlier in the movie, he has – he's been prone to bronchitis and, you know, yeah. all – and, not, and, and, obviously, so. yeah, and obviously his disfigurement gives him a speech impediment, yes. Very, very bad speech impediment, yes. Yeah. And that was one of the hardest things was getting someone to understand him. So he was thought of for a lot of his life as being an imbecile, but he was – he could read. He was He was as educated as someone could be in his – in – in his standing, I guess we should say, right, you know, right. somebody who would quit school at the age of thirteen to go to the workhouse, he was he was fairly educated and fairly well spoken, if you could understand him. And unfortunately, it was uh, people just I don't think they just I just don't think they tried very hard. Yeah, but I do think I find it very interesting that um, there's this you know difference between the cinematic version and then the true story because mm-hmm. you know the 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 way the film presents it is that Merrick is kidnapped, essentially, by Bites and dragged all the way out to Europe. Right. And and he has to – the only way he gets away is by the help of his fellow performers, shall we say. Who I think are supposed to be Roper's midgets. Yeah. Which is what the what the troupe was called um, as part of Roper's traveling traveling sideshow. Yeah. So it's, so it's obviously – so it's obviously much more dramatic and, you yeah. know, in in – exaggerated than the than the actual true right. story and it's and it's more dramatic and it does it does illustrate that he did befriend his other side so sideshow companions because in the movie they foot the bill for him to get on that train yeah they take pity on him because you know he's yeah. being abused by bites right and left and they for t- dead essentially Right, and so they spring him, and then they've taken up a collection, and they said, we're getting you out of here. Yeah. And, uh, oh, they said, no, I'm sorry, Kenny Baker said that. Thank you very much. Yes, Kenny, exactly. the, Kenny Baker, yes. The illustrious, fantastic Kenny Baker, who, now that I think about it, in 1980, had a pretty good year for, for work. Oh, he was killing it, yeah, because, yeah, the same year as Empire Strikes Back, right? So, yep. yeah. So, so um, and then, uh, what else, you know, I, I wrote down here, it's like, oh, hey, you know, obviously... He was Fidget in Time Bandits, and he was in Flash Gordon, Labyrinth, yep. Willow. So, uh huh, yeah. But, for, but it's kind of depressing because if you go to his like his Wikipedia page or his IMDb page, you see so many of his roles listed as dwarf, dwarf, you know. dwarf, uncredited, yeah, dwarf, credit, uncredited, yeah, dwarf, yeah. uncredited. Yeah, so, it's ridiculous. So that had to be incredibly frustrating for him as a person. 
but he he worked like crazy. I mean, he did. Yeah. He did some good stuff. So, you know, rest in rest in peace, Kenny Baker. He's rest no longer with us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But um, so um, that's basically it as far as the the main differences. I I just had a few. Um, mm-hmm. Although apparently, you know, they talk a little bit about his official cause of death was asphyxia. And Trees apparently performed the autopsy, but he said that <laughs> Merrick had died of a dislocated neck. Which could cause asphyxia with yeah. something like his condition where his skull was so incredibly heavy. Right. If he dislocated his neck and he, and things were resting the wrong way, right. that, could, that could break off your wind passage. Yeah. So – your breathing passages. The only other thing I wanted to mention, Charles, was that – Was it just more socially acceptable to say, well, hey, he died of a dislocated neck as opposed to asphyxia. He asphyxiated. It, well, it's, it's, it's a little less de- – I mean we'll talk or about the end gruesome. of this movie and, and how it's really, really freaking depressing. The only other big difference is that his relationship with Mrs. Kendall mm-hmm. – um, probably wasn't as close as it was in this movie. Um, he's probably, it's probably an amalgam of his relationship with Mrs. Kendall, Princess Alexandra, and a friend of Trees's um, named uh, uh, Leela Maturin. Yeah. So I think they just sort of, I think they just sort of amalgamated it. Them. Amalgamated all of his relationships with women into yeah. one, and it was the it was the um, kind of, Mrs. Kind of Kendall, like, character. kind of like what they did with bites, you know, being an amalgamation kind, mm-hmm. of various. Right. Uh, Although Madge Kendall was an actual actress, yeah, she and, was an actual Shakespearean actress during Victorian England theater era when theater theater had a little bit more of a a little bit more of a good opinion. <laughs> I think she was. So it was. It was basically, you know, this this was high society. The so the higher social circles, you know, the the theater. The, you know, if you're if you're a famous theater actress, you obviously right. had more prestige. True, but there. But this is also during the era of you know the theater was still full of weirdos and stuff. So it it kind of went both ways. But she was. She was a, uh, an actress in very good standing. But it was such so a, you she, know, this, like, a, you know, obviously compared to today's celebrity, it's a little different. But but for then, she she would be considered mm-hmm. a celebrity of that age. Right. For people for people who felt that theater was legitimate, not every not everybody did. No, frankly. they didn't. No, they didn't. You know, that's that's was one of that's the true. that was one of the things. I mean, if we're going to um, just talk about more historic, horrible stuff, um, right. that was one of the other reasons why Lizzie Borden became a bit of a social pariah was because once she inherited the money, she started hanging out with theater people. And that was like, well, I always knew she was trash, you know, because <laughs> it, yeah, theater has, theater has always had a really strange, strange relationship with the public, yeah. um, which was why I always found it hilarious that Shakespeare has such a such an hold such a, no such a reputation for being of academia such a highfalutin yeah. reputation for yes. lack of a better term Got it. um because people y- literally used to throw shit at actors yeah at the globe theater <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Which doesn't really say that much about the people, by the way. Doesn't say that much about the people, but it also doesn't say that much about. I what is it? Uh, um, uh, so, may, so maybe you would tragedy compare- plus time equals yeah. comedy. It's I guess it's I guess it's a uh, um, pop culture plus time equals culture. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. So essentially, what you're doing is comparing theater back then to say wrestling now. Reality TV, I would yeah. think. Reality TV would be a fair comparison. Yeah, would okay. be a fair comparison because um, you still get, you know, Kim Kardashian still might get invited to the Kennedy Center honors, but people are going to talk about her. Got it. <laughs> so, whereas I don't think like Hulk Hogan is going to get invited to that. So. Well, maybe when it was alive, Macho Man Randy Savage would. 
Oh boy. Macho man. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He would, he would step gotten, into a Slim Jim. He would have gotten kicked out for smuggling in Slim Jims. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean no outside food? Yeah. I got you for three minutes. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I would. I would. I would say. I love that line from Spider Man. I'm sorry. I love that. Line. Oh, seriously. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the best things in that movie. All right. Um, do you want to run down the cast next, or you want to do some more trivia while we're at it? Let's do some trivia. All right, more trivia. Trivia let's, time. Let's, All let's right, learn so, some things, Charles. Let's, let's learn something. All right. Yeah. So. Um, Jonathan Sanger, the film's producer, apparently optioned the script from writers Christopher DeVore and Eric Berggren after receiving the script from his babysitter. Wow. Right? So, again, not what you know, it's who you know. Who you know. Exactly. Sanger apparently had been working as Mel Brooks's assistant director on High Anxiety, and Sanger showed Brooks the script, which he read and decided to help finance the film through Brooks Films, his new film company. Oh. And, and Brooks's personal assistant, Stuart Cornfield, uh, suggest, was the one who suggested David Lynch to Sanger. It's kind of interesting, right? That, that's that. Yeah, that's very interesting. And see, this is where I like to talk to people who think that David Lynch is just a weirdo. Right. Everybody loves David Lynch. <laughs> well, and, and that's one of the things I also want to get into because you wouldn't expect Mel Brooks to be a David Lynch fan. So Singer met Lynch, and they shared some scripts they were working on, including The Elephant Man and Lynch's Ronnie Rocket, which one uh-huh. of these days we really need to talk about. We really need to talk David about Lynch that, film yeah. that was never made. Right, yeah. Um, and the one he's been thinking about for decades now. So uh-huh. Lynch told Singer that he would love to direct the script after reading it, and Singer endorsed him after hearing Lynch's ideas about it. But Mel Brooks had not heard about Lynch – at the time, so Sanger and Kornfeld set up a screening of a racer head at a screening room at 20th Century Fox, and Brooks loved it. And let's remember, at this point in time, Eraserhead was yeah. David Lynch's only other full-length feature film. Right. He'd done a bunch of short films, but, but right. this, yeah, that was basically – so The Elephant Man is only his second feature film, guys. So he goes from Eraserhead to Oscar-nominated yeah. eight – Eight Oscar nominations. He totally because, leveled up, you guys. Because David Lynch is amazing. Yeah. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is the film, Ele- The Elephant Man, that gave David Lynch mainstream, more at least more mainstream acceptance by Hollywood. Mainstream acceptance, and it showed you that David Lynch can do pretty much anything. He can have his David Lynchiness, which we see in the beginning of this movie with the elephants and the fever dream and... But he can do a historical drama, and it's perfectly linear. It's perfectly understandable. It's right. not It's not so weird, oh, my God, you have to be high to watch it, or rather whatever crap you've ever heard about David Lynch. Yeah. David Lynch can do anything, and because he can do anything, he does whatever he wants. And what he wants is both wonderful and strange. Exactly. Which, hey – we're a podcast for, right? Because we are both a place that's both what... <laughs> we're a place both wonderful and strange. Yes. Exactly. That is that's our jam. So. <laughs> that's our wheelhouse. So yes. so I would just love to have been in that screening room when Mel Brooks is watching Eraserhead. For the first time. Can you can I mean, you imagine like, that? That's like the greatest midnight movie scenario you can possibly oh possibly God. think of. If I ever had you know, like if I ever got my hands on an actual TARDIS from Doctor Who yeah, that would be one of the things I would want to go see. I, uh-huh. would, I would find a way to be there, sneak in, you know, somewhere in the back, and just you know, or just you know, somewhere where I could watch Mel just watching watch Eraserhead. Mel Brooks watch Eraserhead and and absolutely love it. And I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure he did. And that's what made convinced him to let Lynch direct the film. So yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's yeah, David Lynch can do anything. Yeah. Now, if you notice. Also in this movie, Mel Brooks is intentionally left uncredited because Mm -hmm. they wanted to avoid confusion from audiences who thought because of Mel's previous works that that they would have – like maybe they would have expected The Elephant Man to be a comedy. Can you imagine somebody thinking The Elephant Man is going to be like the next Young Frankenstein? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Oh, my God. There was a – Charles, I'm going to tell a little 
Local. I ain't got nobody. Yucka dacka, yucka dacka. Yucka dacka, yucka dacka, yucka dacka. <laughs> and I don't need to make fun of his impediment, by the way. Just, you I take just, the blonde, I'll take the one with the diamond. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to tell a little local local humor story. Um, we used to have a local free paper here in Columbus, Ohio, called The Paper. The other paper. I, and miss, it had I, I miss the other paper of, so much. By the way. I missed the other paper. Yeah, they they had a, a grid of movies that would give you what the movie was, what it was rated, a little bit of a synopsis, and like mm-hmm. where it was playing. And, <laughs> and it was always done tongue in cheek, by the way. Very, very tongue in cheek. And so it had the grid, but then there were also full on movie reviews of everything new that had come out that week. Well, the movie Twenty Eight Days Later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When that when that the came zombie out, zombie film, zombie, yeah, the zombie days. movie, yes. right? They put jokingly in their grid that this was after Sandra Bullock gets sober, she has to fight zombies or something like that. (laughs) Because there is a Sandra Bullock movie called 28 Days. Sober, right? Where she – no, just 28 Days. Oh, just 28 Days. Okay, Just 28 Days where she goes to rehab. They got an angry letter from somebody who said they went to see 28 Days Later thinking it was a Sandra Bullock movie. (laughs) Because of what the other paper had written in their grid. <laughs> and they were... They totally deserve what they got as far as I'm They concerned. were sorely disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm imagining. People thinking, I went to go see the latest Mel Brooks movie and I've never cried so much in my entire life. Mel Brooks has really gone downhill. Yeah. Mel Brooks has gotten dark. Yeah. What happened? This is his dark period, yeah. Yeah, this is... I think that was probably a good call on their on their part because... right. You're not – you see black and white Mel Brooks, you think you're going to see the greatest comedy of all time. Yeah. Well, and especially, you know, after a film like Young Frankenstein, which was shot in black and white. Also black and white, yeah. Yeah, so you figure, well, okay, it's just Mel doing another black and white film. Although Also black and white, yeah. also a historical quote-unquote monster. This would not have been that much of a stretch No. to think we were going to see John Hurt sing Putting on the Ritz. Right. <laughs> And I'm kind of, and now I have the mental. Kind of sad we didn't. Aren't we? I know, right? I kind of have this mental visual of the elephant man singing, putting on the red. <laughs> he does have that walking stick. He could have right. done the well, and <laughs> he could have done a little tap dance. Twirly, twirly, oh. twirly. Oh man, this this was a missed opportunity. <laughs> I know, right? Mel, you really need to rethink this. Yeah. Oh boy. This could be no. like the final cap. To your career, exactly. So. Yeah, well, we All don't right. have we don't we don't have John Hurt anymore. We don't have I know, I know, I know, and Bancroft know. anymore. Yeah. So you yeah. know the, the moment has passed. But yeah, we it do not we do need to run down the cast because they obviously have a lot of. But but I just wanted to finish up a couple more things of trivia. Yes, trivia. Uh, all right, so um, well, that was good. Lynch tried to do the makeup himself because hey, it's Lynch. He's kind of a control freak like that. Yeah, no, <laughs> but. But it didn't quite work. The design didn't quite work. So they brought in Christopher Tucker. Thank goodness. Thank goodness, right? And it was um, directly designed from casts of John, or excuse me, Joseph Merrick's body. Right. He's his skeleton is still available yeah. for medical students. Yeah, it's it's apparently. And there is. Go ahead. There's a there's a like a plaster cast on display at a museum. And that's what they used. Yeah, it was apparently been. Yeah, his body was kept in the Royal London Hospital's private museum. Mm-hmm. And that's only only for medical students and doctors are able to view the real one. But there is there is one for public view that is a that is a plaster cast of it. Yeah. So the makeup took seven. Un- eight- Let's just and I'm just want to say. Yeah. Dispelling the rumor that it was purchased by Michael Jackson. Right. It it never actually was. <laughs> You mean the skeleton, yeah, yeah. The skeleton was never yeah. actually purchased by Michael Jackson, yes. Yeah. Although you wouldn't have been surprised if it was. I believe he tried, but they said, get the hell out of here, Michael yeah, Jackson. Exactly. Shame on you, Michael Jackson. Shame on you. Yeah. He is not an animal. He is a human being. <laughs> okay. Get the hell out of here and take your monkeys with you. Well played. Well played. Yeah. So the makeup... Michael Jackson, by the way, had pet monkeys. <laughs> He had pet monkeys. I think he yes. had like some alpacas. Uh, he had all kinds of exotic birds in his in his private zoo in Neverland. So yeah, just yeah. yeah. That's that's where that that's where that came from. So the makeup took seven to eight hours to apply each day and two hours to delicately remove. 
And John Hurt would arrive on the set at 5 a.m., shoot his scenes from noon until 10 p.m. And when Hurt was having his first experiences and when problems with the the makeup and having to perform with it, he called his girlfriend up and said, I think they finally managed to make me hate acting. <laughs> That's so, a 10 hour day for him. Yeah. Without even actually acting. Yeah, exactly. Eight well, hours in the chair to start and two hours in the chair to, to end. Well, yeah. You I mean, cause you show up. Yeah. Five hours. Yeah. You don't get there till, you know, you said it took seven to eight hours to yeah, apply the true. makeup and then yeah, two hours yeah, to take it off. That's yeah, 10 hours yeah. without even getting on set. Yeah, exactly. So it's like close to like 17, 18 hours. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, right? Yeah, it's ridiculous. But he, yeah. consummate professional that consummate, man was. Yeah, consummate. For, yeah. This is why he has a sir to his name, by the way. That damn guess. Yeah, exactly. So Because, because yeah. some of the greatest special effects in the history of film revolve around John Hurt. Now, here's a fun little trivia bit. So because of the – all right. I mean, Lynch apparently wanted – Jack Nance for the title role. Oh, so we no. almost, so we almost got Pete Martell as the Elephant Man, or you know, I I love me Henry some from, Jack Nance, Henry from Eraserhead, but yeah, yeah, I love me some Jack Nance, but I don't know how well he could have pulled off the British accent consistently. I don't either. I don't see that happening. Yeah. So this is probably a good thing somebody got a hold of him and, and said no. We'll get, like, Sir John Hurt, Jack Nance, you know. Like, Oddly enough, too, this yeah. is, like, the only movie that that David Lynch did while Jack Nance was alive that Jack Nance is not in. Right. Well, there's a lot of, you know, surprisingly, this film doesn't have – his usual Twin Peaks uh, repertoire of actors. I mean, there's only like a couple, which I'll talk about when we get to the casting. There's no, yeah, he didn't really have a regular, regular stock of players. He, his I think usual, his yeah. usual go to his, his actors. usual, you know, gang of yeah. his usual gang of idiots. <laughs> for, <laughs> if we want to make a mad magazine reference. Um, nice. Nice. I think he really put that together with Dune because that's where you get Kyle MacLachlan, Everett McGill. You've got Jack Nance again. You've right. you know you've got that's, you've that's got your prop really, now. That's where essentially uh, his crew was formed in Dune. Yeah, his crew was formed there, but Jack Nance and Catherine Coulson, yeah, had been with him from the very beginning. Since this is like, head, yeah, yeah. So this is like the the rare the rare movie where Jack Nance is alive but not in. Yeah. So so this is this is essentially. Lynch starting over with a fresh new slate of actors. Yeah. And yeah. Much, more, like Lynch, much more acclaimed actors, shall we say. It's yeah. like he got popular and forgot his old friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's why he went back. He's like, okay, it was kind of fun to, to you know, to be the popular kid, but now I want to go back and do more. Now indie. I'm, bring, I'm bringing I'm you guys I'm with going me. Going back I'm to my gravy indie, train. Yeah. I'm going back to my indie rock phase. Yeah. I'm, go, I'm bringing my friends on my gravy train, which, you know. Worked. <laughs> yeah, credit. Yeah, that was. That, that, yeah, I think it turned out pretty well. Um, so the role went to John Hurt after Brooks Lynch and Sanger saw his performance in The Naked Civil Servant as Quentin Crisp, which I've never seen. Oh, okay, I've never seen that movie, so I couldn't. I haven't seen that either. But, you know, so so that's. I don't know whether you give it to him after just seeing Alien. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. Because again. <laughs> It was interesting because you bring that you bring up a great point because Alien was what nineteen seventy nine nine yeah. and then Alpha Man nineteen eighty so essentially this was right after he did Alien so he probably he basically spent a year in the makeup chair yeah <laughs> I think you know being yes <laughs> being Kane with the thing coming out of his yes. chest and then being Joseph Merrick right <laughs> yeah two of the greatest feats of special effects. In the history of film, yep. are John Hurt, are John Hurt, and now you know why he said, "Oh no, not again, not again." In space, that one that one wasn't as good, but it was awesome. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it counts. As far as I'm concerned, it counts. All right, check please. All right, so since we're kind of on the subject of casting, how about we switch to that? Let's switch to that. All right. right, let's talk about let's talk about John Hurt. Okay, so yeah, first and foremost, we have to talk about Sir John Hurt, who I'm wearing a shirt in tribute of. Oh, look at your doctor shirt with yes, the war doctor. So yes, yeah, so yep. so obviously as a Doctor Who fan, as obviously you know from my Next Top Everywhere podcast, 
that I do with Jesse and hey, Zan Sprouse every so often. Um, when she's not when she's not dying of a headache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's okay. You can you can make up to me at some future point if you want. Um, I'll do that. So the war doc, you, you have Sir John Hurt, obviously known <laughs> as the war doctor in uh, the Doctor Who episodes, the name of the doctor and the day of the doctor, the big mm-hmm. 50th anniversary episode. He's like and, not really a doctor. He's like a doctor point oh. <laughs> well, he's the word. He's, he's essentially doctor 8.5, the 8.5. Doctor, yeah, the, doctor the, 8.5. The, the, the yeah. eight and a half doctor. Exactly. The between uh, Paul McGann and Christopher Eccleston's Doctor. Yeah. So, um, and also he did reprise the role for Big Finish for their War Doctor audio adventure series. Shortly I didn't know he did a Big Finish. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, he, he did 12 of them. Uh, Holy crap. I, yeah. I am behind on everything so, I've listened and, to. And they're fantastic. So, and, and it was short. Yeah, because they're John Hurt. Well, and he did those shortly before his death. So, mm-hmm. so it's it's awesome that he did those. Um, right, he was acting right up until the almost the very end. So um, it's cool. It's so great that it, at least we have those. In addition, oh my god, this movie! I, I just I just realized it. Not to spoil it, this movie yeah. has three OBEs in it. Yes, it does. And so that's that's our first. That's our that's first, our first sir. OBE. That's yeah. our first sir. Our first sir. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, you know, he played as we talked about just now, Kane in Alien and Spaceballs. Alien and Spaceballs. Because it's the same Heck. guy, same guy, same yeah. character. Um, yeah. And then he was also, obviously, Professor Broom in the two Hellboy films, the only ones that mm-hmm. matter, Hellboy and <laughs> Hellboy 2, The Golden Nothing Army. against David Harbour. No, nothing against David Harbour, but come on. It's Guillermo del Toro and Ron Perlman. Guillermo del Toro. And Doug Candace Jones. No and Doug Jones. Yeah. So, um, I worked was, for Doug Jones. Yeah. Garrick Ollivander, he played, or he played Garrick Ollivander in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone and the two Deathly Hallows movies. The wand chooses the wizard, not the other way around. Exactly. And he was Professor Oxley in the um, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which we don't like to talk about too much. But but that was one of my, one of my favorite scenes in that, where he's trying to get him to come back to yeah. reality. He was a great character and, in it. I yeah, did. and Indiana Jones looks at him and he just says, they're going to kill Abner's little girl. And I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. That is Abner. That's Abner Ravenwood's child. Yeah. <laughs> and so, that movie did a good job of pulling at your nostalgic heartstrings. Yeah, so John Hurt, one of the better things about that movie, as far as I'm concerned. Uh-huh. And, he, and he was the villainous Adam Sutler in V for Vendetta. Oh. He was so good in that. We need to remind the public why they need us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah he's so good. Yeah. So good. And he played, of course, Winston Smith in the film 1984. Oh, my God. Winston Smith. Yeah. I don't know. If you guys haven't seen that movie, you really need to, especially if you're fans of the Eurythmics. Yes, exactly. And uh, Sex Crime. This is a sex crime. Yeah. Yeah. Great song. Yeah. And are you going to talk about Contact, Charles? Uh, No, because I had to cut it somewhere, because otherwise we'd be here all day because John Hurt has done so many awesome things. But so if you want to talk about Contact, go ahead. Why make one when you can have two for twice the price? (laughs) I just wanted to say that line because because contact is wonderful. You are so fantastic with the quotes. You are you are you are completely on point today. Rest in peace, Carl Sagan. Exactly. Uh, So our second sir, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Hell yeah! As Frederick Trees. Well, hey, he played a. Just a little known character by the name of Dr. Hannibal Lecter. I think I heard of him. Yeah. I think I've heard of him. Yeah. And if you haven't seen the movie Magic, Mm -hmm. you need to see the movie Magic. Yeah. He's really good in that too. Okay. Yes. Because that movie is freaking terrifying. Mm -hmm. And it will remind you that Anne Margaret is damn good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he played, of course, Dr. Hannibal Lecter in The Science of the Lambs and Hannibal and Red Dragon. Red Dragon, where we so. get to see Ray finds his cash and prizes. <laughs> Is that what we're calling it? Is that? Oh, it was it was <laughs> Um, Phrasing. <laughs> or, as, or as my Australian friends taught me, meat and two veg. Yeah. Or meat and two berries, yeah. yeah. <laughs> meat and two veg, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, you're going to sit here and tell me that guys don't know every movie that their favorite actresses' boobies are in. I mean, come on. 
I plead the fifth on that one. Yeah, you can't, you're can't. you not going to sit there and try and convince me of that, okay? Uh, MrSkin.com, I'm just saying. <laughs> we all, we've all been there. We all know what it is. All right. More recently, he's uh, been known as playing Odin, the All-Father, in the Thor, oh, heck yeah, he's Thor movies. Father. Yep. So, yeah, he's, uh, mm-hmm. he's Thor's daddy. And, of course, uh, he's recently played Dr. Robert Ford on Westworld, and he's fantastic on that. Oh, my God. So Westworld good. is so good. So good. So good. So good. Uh, one of my personal favorites, uh, where he played the original Zorro, a.k.a. Don Diego de la Vega, in The Mask mm-hmm. of Zorro. The That's 19- right. The 1998 version, of course, with Antonio Banderas. Wasn't he also one of the million awesome people in The Lion in Winter? Wasn't Anthony Hopkins? Yes, he that? was. Yes, he totally was. Yeah, yeah he was. Fin- yeah. He played uh, Richard in that one, if I recall correctly. I believe. I believe so. Yeah. yeah, that was a that was a heck of a cast. Yeah, it was. It was. Maybe we need uh, to get drunk and watch that movie. Well, I've got it. I've got that. Movie. <laughs> I've got that movie. So one of the best soundtracks ever. That's so a, good. Yeah, it's really good. Um, Catherine Hepburn's in that movie, if I recall correctly. Yeah, one yeah. Of the, yeah. We got yeah. to watch that in history class when I was in high school. Yeah. We got to watch it in history class. Yep. So, um, and we played Abraham Van Helsing in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh yeah. Yeah, he was in that. Yeah. Oh, that's right. The Francis Ford Coppola. One. Yeah, it was. It was more than just um, Keanu Reeves and um, uh, what's his face. Um, Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman. Thank you. Yeah, I had a little mm-hmm. little senior moment there. Uh-huh. Uh, like you're like you're not going to tell me that you're only paying attention to Sadie Frost in that movie. I mean, please. <laughs> <laughs> I know what boys like. Boys like, yeah. Right. <laughs> Sucker. Sucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hannah Gordon played Anne Trees. And mm-hmm. here's another Doctor Who connection. I was going to say, are we going to talk about her Doctor Who connection? We are going to talk about her Doctor Who connections. She played Kirsty McLaren in The Highlanders, Patrick mm-hmm. Troughton's second story, which, of course, introduced uh, Jamie McCrimmon, played, of course, by Fraser Hines. And she also she also voiced the ship in the Tom Baker serial Shada, written, of course, by the oh. great Douglas Adams, the late great Heck Douglas. yeah. The late great Douglas Adams. Which was recently restored through animation. Awesome. Yep. Uh, Anne Bancroft, like as we talked about, the wife of Mel Brooks as Madge Kendall. And most notably as known as Mrs. Robinson in The Graduate. Yes, Mrs. Robinson in The Graduate. Are you, try- are you trying to seduce me? Did you did you see them on, uh, I don't remember, was it the Tonys or the Oscars? I don't remember what it was, but they were doing... A it was it was her and Dustin Hoffman, yeah. and they were uh, presenting an award together. And he says, "Are you trying to seduce me?" And everybody laughs. And she looks him up and down, and then looks right at the audience and says, "Not anymore." Oh, it was amazing. Cold. nice. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing. So and you think that was lived or scripted? I don't care. Whatever it was, it was genius, and she killed it. Yes, yeah, she it did. Was fan- it was fantastic. That sounds fantastic. I got to talk a little bit about Anne Bancroft for a second. Please do. Um, as you know, Charles. Yes. I have some pretty long-standing, severe body issues. Unfortunately, that yes, I understand. Anne Bancroft wrote and directed a wonderful movie called Fatso. Yep. Starring Dom DeLuise. Mm-hmm. And if you have ever struggled with your weight or known someone that has struggled with your weight, you need to see this movie because it is a wonderful therapeutic insight to what it's like to try and just be who you are and not have everybody try and change you all the time. Right. So Anne Bancroft is very near and dear to my heart. Got it. For that, just that reason. Yeah. For that reason. Yeah. So I thought it was also for another reason because... Hey, she voiced Dr. Sveig on a Simpsons episode, Fear of Flying. Fear of Flying, yes. Let me off, let me off, let me off, let me off. (laughs) Yes, Marge has a fear of flying, and so she goes to see a therapist to figure out what her fear of flying is all about, and her therapist is... Anne Bancroft. Is Anne Bancroft, yeah. Yep, yep. Turns out she was scarred by the fact that her father was a, a stewardess back in, like, the 70s. Yeah. 
So. I, ho- I hope you appreciated that. Uh, I made sure to include that Simpsons. Uh, I, I in, in well, if you hadn't, I would have. I know you would. I know you would have. So I'd, <laughs> I just had to set it up for you. That's all. And of course, being the wife of Mel Brooks, she was in a lot of his movies. She played herself right. in Silent Movie, Anna Bronski mm-hmm. in To Be or Not to Be. Which is a fantastic, fantastic, hilarious remake of the Ernst Lubbock classic. Mm-hmm. So I highly recommend that. For something and, that's not like written by Mel Brooks, that's a fantastic movie. And Madame Ospenskaya in Dracula Dead and Loving It. I always forget about that movie, Dracula Dead and people, Loving It. A lot it. of people do because it's not that great of a movie. Well, it... It was I, kind of the thing that killed his career, really. Well, Directly. it's... It's Leslie Nielsen, right? It's Leslie Nielsen, yes. I always because it's Leslie Nielsen in my head. It's a it's a Zucker Brothers movie. Yeah. I I for some reason I keep I always think in my head it's a Zucker Brothers movie, and that's not right. No, no. You know. Yeah, it was kind of like the send up of Bram Stoker's Dracula a little bit, but. Right, right, but uh, I mean, I was not the hugest fan of Robin Hood Men in Tights. I, it's okay. I I think it's okay. It's got its moments. It's yeah, it's okay, but it's it's, it's not, not great. It's, it's not great. It's it's not spaceballs. Yeah. I mean. Well, you know, spaceballs kind of started the decline a little bit because spaceballs is you know, it's not as good as say obviously Young Frankenstein or Blazing Saddles. Okay, it's better than Blazing Saddles. You think spaceballs is better than Blazing Saddles? I am one of like the three people in the world that is not a huge fan of Blazing Saddles. I was going to say, you've got to be in the minority on that one because I'm – in a, I'm in a major minority on that one. Now, I will tell you that I think that one of the most underrated comedic actors on this planet mm-hmm. is, Harvey Cor- is Harvey Corman. Yeah. I think he's extremely underrated. But I, if, you, if you said, we're going to watch a Mel Brooks movie tonight, you can pick Spaceballs or Blazing Saddles. I'm going to pick Spaceballs. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Nothing is as good as Young Frankenstein. No. No, the I, only thing that even comes close to Young Frankenstein is the producers. Which I've not seen, believe it or not. Oh my god, it's so funny. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's That's one of Mel, a, that's one of few Mel's films that I haven't seen. It's just so fun the music is so funny. I mean and it's and I just Somehow I, I missed I, that one. I just I just love Mel Brooks as a as a Right up Hitler's patoot. I, just, <laughs> I think it's he just really, really sticks it to Hitler, and it's I, yeah. I I love that he owns that. You know, nobody does Hitler is horrible in a funny way better than Mel Brooks. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah, it's kind of his. You know, he he was it was a ripe target for someone like Mel who's Jewish. So it's yeah, per- yeah, yeah, per- absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and right. he does. A, it's it's phenomenal, yeah, yeah. It's phenomenal, but young, yeah. Nothing nothing is better than Young Frankenstein. That is his that is his best movie, and it is tied in my mind for the greatest American film comedy in the history of film. See, I with, I, with Airplane, I, I rank Blazing Saddles right alongside um, Young Frankenstein. No, I think, I, I think those are the top two right there. I mean, easy. yeah, no, I I would I would say Young Frankenstein and the producers. Okay. That's that's all right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I respect that. Um, so our third sir in this movie, Sir John Gilgood, played Which so many people like our age yes. think of him as a comedic actor. Yeah. And it's because of Arthur, Arthur. and Arthur, Arthur and Arthur Two on the rocks. He's so freaking good in Arthur because that that's played, what we know him from. He plays Hobson, the kind of like smart ass Alfred Pennyworth. Yeah, to, to Dudley Moore's. Um, I'll Arthur. alert the media. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, he's he's fantastic, yeah. but so many people who like so many Gen Xers think of him as this comedic dead actor. comedian, yeah. but no, yeah. he can do no. freaking anything. He's reason, like a the, Lawrence Olivier type of a guy. Exactly. The reason he's a sir is because he did like a ton of stage work and a ton of Shakespeare, and um, just you know he. Was became, he- he was. was he, all, go ahead. Was he an I Claudius? Was he one of those guys? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So it's been a long time since I've seen that. So so, so he play, in this movie in, in the Elephant Man he plays Francis Cargom, the head mm-hmm. of the hospital, mm-hmm. and he was also in the movies Elizabeth, Gandhi, Chariots of Fire, 
and the original Murder on the Orient Express from 1974, the Peter Houston mm-hmm. version. Yeah. Fan- all fantastic movies. Yeah. Yeah. Although I do like the um, Kenneth Branagh remake. I, I, am, I have such Kenneth Branagh fatigue these days. Yeah. He's, it's really, he's actually really good. That's a really good movie. He's he's good, but I just I prefer him when he's just acting. But when he's trying to like do everything, like yeah. written and directed and the yeah, you know, when he, it's like when he, when he tries to be the triple threat, yeah, he needs to keep it simple, like like Harry the, Potter, where he's just acting, or even or even something like uh his his remake of Sleuth. I don't know if you saw his remake. I've of Sleuth. never seen. It. I've not seen that. Have you seen the original? Sleuth with Lawrence Olivier and Michael I've not seen that either, no. Okay, you need to see them both because they're fantastic. Um, Sleuth is a two-actor play. Yeah. Okay? Um, There's a young man and an older man, and in the original with Lawrence Olivier and Michael Caine, Michael Caine is the younger man. In the newer one, it's Michael Caine and Jude Law, and Michael Caine is the older character. Okay. So if for Michael Caine fans, this is is an absolute must, but yeah, Kenneth Branagh directed that. Mm Mm-hmm. He's not in it. <laughs> He's not in it. He so didn't you're, write so, it. <laughs> so you're cool, so you're cool with him directing if he doesn't act I'm, in it, or if he if he acts in it but doesn't direct it. I'm just thinking about you know Frankenstein and yeah. Hamlet and that yeah. kind of stuff where it just got out of hand. Yeah. You know, as much as I love Dead Again, you know, it's like it started to get out of hand a little bit. I think. Well, well personally, I liked his his version of Murder on the Orient Express, and I'm looking forward to uh, Death on the Nile. If we ever get to see it. If, if movies ever happen again. If movies right? ever happen again, yeah. Now, yeah. our first dame of the movie, I think our only dame of the movie, Dame Wendy Hiller plays Mrs. Mother's Head. Oh, one of my favorite scenes of this. <laughs> yeah. And she was also in the 1974 Murder on the Orient Express, by the way. And she was also in Voyage of the Damned, which is such a great Voyage t- of... Which is such a great title, even Doctor Who ripped it off in for a Doctor Who episode. Oh yeah, Voyage of the Damned is uh, <laughs> that's it. That's it. What is Voyage of the Damned about, Charles? Uh, it's a you know it's a, one of those disaster flicks. So exactly. Yeah. It is. It is a disaster movie. It's kind of like the Poseidon Adventure. It's like bit. a Poseidon Adventure. Yeah, yeah. It is. It's it's like a Poseidon Adventure, and. It's one of those, and I'm trying to I'm trying to remember who directed this one. I don't know. I, um, I'm, I there's there's a there's a reason why I need to look it up. Um, oh, you know who did the poster? What? Richard Amsell, who is oh you yeah. know he's 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 like yeah, he's a... Lo, like a Drew Struzan, but you know a little better in my opinion. Oh, but <laughs> Ooh, controversial. Ooh, I know. Fighting words, right? Yeah. What does Chris think about that? Uh, no, Does he I share your opinion on that one? No, I don't. I do not think he shares. I don't think he shares my opinion on that one at all. But yeah, no, this one. This was directed by Stuart Rosenberg, and it's it it's it it has the feel of one of those, um, Irwin Allen <laughs> disaster. Oh, okay. Disaster so, movies. Yeah. But um, it also stars uh, Dame Janet Sussman, who oh. is the cousin of our friend. DJ Nick. Interesting. Yeah. Well, there you go, Nick. Hope you're listening because we just gave so, your cousin a shout out. So I need to give uh, Cousin Janet, as he calls her, yeah. Dame Janet Susman, a shout out whenever I can because she is an amazing woman. There you so. go. There you go. Fantastic. All right. Um, our first Lynch, you know, rep, our Lynch crew mm-hmm. uh, actor, Freddie Jones, of course, plays Mr. Bites. <laughs> Through for Hawat. Through for Hawat in Dune, 1984 mm-hmm. version, of course. Yep. Uh, but he was also in Wild at Heart as playing George Kovich. Yes. So, yes, that's right. So he's but he was, this will be, you know, he was in three David Lynch films. Mm-hmm. He also was in the movie Crawl. I was going to say, he's one of like the three good things in the movie Crawl. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And he was also in Firestarter. Oh my God, Fire. God, that was on TV the other day. Yeah, yeah. Why anybody thought it was okay to make George C. Scott a Native American, I will never understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was also did a voice in The Black Cauldron. Heck yeah. And he was in Young Sherlock Holmes. And he was also on an episode of the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. So I thought that was interesting. Freddie Jones is awesome. Yep. My browser not. He's awesome. 
Yeah, I wish somebody was streaming yeah. that. I would, like, why isn't Disney Plus streaming that? I have no idea. That's a really good question. Yeah, I wonder what, what, what's what, the deal. Like, what's the what's the, per- the legal hold up with that? I wonder. It's probably something involving Paramount. I'm guessing. But that would make sense. Yeah, because you know Paramount be. Plus, um, maybe Paramount has the streaming. There's rights. a Paramount. There's a Paramount network. Throw that on the Paramount channel for at yeah, two in the morning. I know. I, would, I don't know why somebody isn't airing those. I'll DVR um, that crap. Michael Elphick as Jim, you know, the evil night porter guy that mm. drags drunk people around to harass uh, poor poor John Merrick. She's the only one that can sack me now. Whack. Yeah, done. Sacked him with a, <laughs> with, with a like a bedpan or something. <laughs> like with like some sort of like package. I don't, I don't know. know I don't know what I don't know what she hit him with. I was kind of wondering yeah. about that. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. Interestingly, he was in the movie Gorky Park. Oh, wow. Have you seen that? I have seen a little bit of it on cable. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting. I never movie. watched it all the way through. Yeah, because um, – You know, one of those things where I'm flipping channels and I kind of watch it for about 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And then I go see what else is on. But Communist Russia didn't want the world to think that communism could breed serial killers. Yeah. But it could. <laughs> Surprise. So. So if you are a true crime fan, I definitely, definitely recommend Gorky Park. Yeah, I've heard good things about Gorky Park. One of these days, yeah. I need, I do need to watch it. It's uh, one that you don't see, or it doesn't like come up on cable very no, much. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's very hard to find. Uh, he was also, interestingly, in The Curse of the Pink Panther, you know, the not really good one that was... Um, Is that the one where Herbert Lom has like the... No, that's... that's no, that was the guy... That the one where it's just uh, clips? No, that was the one that had Danny from Soap on it. Oh, that one. Okay, yeah. I don't even think I saw that one. Yeah, but it, but yeah, it was it was like it was after Trail of the Pink Panther, which you know had uh, Peter Sellers dying about halfway through, so they had to kind right. of it was, rework the movie. It was a clip show of movies. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> Curse of the Pink Panther was the one after that where they tried to relaunch the franchise with a completely different character, and it do failed not, miserably. You do not do Pink Panther movies without Clouseau. You know what? If you wanted to do a Pink Panther movie with Sasha Baron Cohen, yep. I would approve. <laughs> but he's the only person that could even potentially. That would be interesting. That would be Sasha interesting. Baron, yeah. Sasha Baron Cohen, in my opinion, is very much like a Peter Sellers because yeah. he's such a private person. And whenever you see him in public, he's yeah. always a character. He does kind of have an Andy Kaufman vibe about him. It's more of a Peter Sellers vibe. You think? Though. You think? I, I think so, but I think he's a I think he's a more decent human being than Peter Sellers was. Yeah. Peter Sellers was kind of an ass. Right. Um, but he's he's that type. He's that sort of chameleon and that sort of poking fun at accents while still being a little bit respectful of it at the same time. So yeah, he's the only one that I think should be allowed to try any sort of Inspector Clouseau yeah. uh, reanimation. <laughs> right. Yeah. Certainly not Steve Martin. As it turns Certainly out. not Steve Martin. Yeah. yeah. Nothing, nothing against Steve Martin. I like he's... Steve Martin. I'm a big Steve Martin fan, but yeah. he's completely wrong for that. He was, he was wrong for that. He needs to stick to LA story type things. Yeah. Or like something like Roxanne. He was brilliant in Roxanne, as far as I can Roxanne's fun, yeah. Dead men don't wear plaid. The jerk. The jerk, yeah. The jerk. That's a great stuff. All right. Um, so uh, he was also, let's see, so Michael Elphick also in Krull, so another Krull vet, mm-hmm. and Quadrophenia. Oh, Quadrophenia. That's which an is interesting pretty, one. Which are pretty eclectic. Um <laughs> Also featuring Resume. another David Lynch player, yeah. Sting. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Yep. You, you would. Oh wait, I got. I got that put up. Um, Helen Ryan played Alexandra, Princess of Wales. Princess Alexandra, who I love the scene with her, mm-hmm. where they're all talking. The 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 directors, the board of directors at the hospital, are trying to decide whether or not Joseph Merrick should be allowed to stay at the hospital because the hospital is a place for curing people yes there are places where un- in un- incurable people can go and this yeah. is not one of them and, and, there's... The, and the board is so adamant that you know that merrick you know isn't sick 
technically. So therefore he should mm-hmm. be here. They can't help him. He can go somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. So, and there's one doctor who is completely unwavering and will never change his mind. And then Princess Alexandra comes in, reads a letter from Victoria, and then it's a unanimous vote. Because, right. Yeah, he, and because he, you get that slow hand raise of acceptance. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Because when it, when, it comes to, when it comes to the mistreatment of Joseph Merrick. Yeah. Nobody trumps the Queen. Queen Victoria, Queen Victoria was not amused. <laughs> yes. You were saving that up, weren't you? Uh, yes! <laughs> It's good to be the queen. It's good to be the queen. <laughs> <laughs> to paraphrase another Mel Brooks film. Uh huh. Exactly. So um, yeah, I, I love the scene with Princess Alexandra. Yeah. Leslie Dunlop played Nora. That was the Merrick's nurse. That was initially so petrified by him, but then it but eventually then, comes around. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. It, it, that's the whole message of the story of Joseph Merrick is that it doesn't matter what somebody looks like when you first see them. Yeah. It's all about who they are, and and he was a wonderful person. And that's one of the things that this film tries to teach you is acceptance right. and yeah. tolerance. So she also has a Doctor Who connection twice, believe it or not. Nice. Yeah. So she was uh, played a character named Norna in Frontios from the Peter Davison era, and most notably, she was Susan Q in the Happiness Patrol from the Sylvester mm-hmm. McCoy era, which is a story we haven't covered yet, so you need to talk about that because Ace is in it. Oh, maybe. Yes. Pencil me in for that. Yeah, that was so. Ace that... and a David Lynch connection? Oh, I think that sounds like me. <laughs> and, hey, great satire on uh, Margaret Thatcher in that episode, in that story. I am over. I am willing to <laughs> overlook NJT for something like that. <laughs> right. One of my uh, one of my favorite actors, um, character actors, W. Morgan Shepard turns up in this movie as mm-hmm. one of the guys in the pub. Yep. And he was a, he's also a David Lynch vet from playing Mr. Reindeer in Wild at Heart. Oh, Mr. Reindeer. Yeah, Mr. Reindeer. I need to watch Wild at Heart. It's been so long. And he has a Doctor Who connection, of course, as yeah. Old Canton Everett Delaware the uh, the father of, or the older version of his son, Mark Shepard. Who's in that story is the younger kid, oh. Devil Aware the Third, in the okay. impos- in the Impossible Astronaut from the Matt Smith era. Oh, okay, gotcha. But um, W. Morgan Shepherd, Shepherd, a great genre vet. He was the Vulcan Science Minister in Star Trek: The 2009 Film. He was the Klingon Prison Warden in Star Trek VI. He was one of my personal favorites, Blank Reg on Max Headroom. Oh wow, Max Headroom. Yep, I'm a big Max Headroom fan. That's a that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Love that show, um, especially because you know it had uh, Amanda Pays in it. She was fabulous, and uh, he was also on a, a ton of other things, including Babylon Five, Star Trek: The Next Generation, Star Trek: Voyager. You name it, he's been in it, and he's just a, a great character actor. And it's another great place to to see him. So I had to mention him. And then lastly, but certainly not leastly, Kenny Baker as the plumed dwarf, whom we talked about, was, of course, R2-D2 in the Star Wars films, Fidget and Time Bandits, Flash Gordon, Labyrinth, and Willow. Kenny Baker. Yeah. Fant- Kenny Baker's fantastic. One of the nicest people I've ever met, too. Oh, really? Yeah. I got to meet him at one of the first conventions I ever went to, and I was like, oh, my fucking God. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Kenny Baker. That's cool. And um, glad to he, know he wasn't a jerk. He was not a jerk, and he sang "Me and My Shadow" for me. <laughs> he did. That's awesome. <laughs> not the whole song, but just a couple of bars. No, just of it. a couple of bars of it. That's awesome. Which is uh, that's fantastic. Uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, we not should many, also. Not many people can say they've been serenaded by R two D two. Nope, not many people can. But I, I can, I can. Which was pretty awesome. That, is, um, that makes you special. We should also mention Robert Day, Charles. Okay. Um, when the elephant man gets back to London and he's being chased through right. the train station by a couple of kids, the pea shooter kid. Yeah. He, he lives in Ohio now. So yeah. we just want to, I just want to give a little shout out. I think we've talked about him before on this podcast. If I recall, I think correct. we have talked about him. Yes, but he lives in Ohio now. So yeah, that's cool. Yep. Very cool. So a little local shout out. So hi, Robert Day, if you're out there listening yeah, hope, to us. Hope you're listening. All right. Let's see what else. Uh, do you want to talk about the score? I do. Um, I do want to talk about John Morris for a little bit um, because because I don't have that much. So why don't you go ahead and 
indulge yourself there. I, I, I thought he did a fantastic job with this because, again, what we're used to with him is comedic scores because he did a lot of Mel Brooks stuff, including like Young Frankenstein. Oh. So so the the very famous dramatic chipmunk blah, 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 yeah. is John Morris. That's awesome. So, yeah. So um, there's it, it, all of the music in this is original to him except for uh, Barbara's Adagio for Strings, which is the piece of music that is playing when Joseph Merrick passes away. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, that was um, – I was, I was reading up on that and apparently – um, John Morris was not a fan of the use of the adagio uh -huh. because he thought that it would kind of overshadow his work and he didn't, and Lynch was the one who actually added that to the film. Um, oh boy. I just, I, I can understand that because it is, it is sort of jarring to have. He kind of thought that if it, it was used, it would like, everybody would be using it. Well, I can see from a composer standpoint that if you are um, doing the score, you want to do the score. And so to have your score up until, I don't want to say climax of a movie, but the culmination of the entire story and have it be somebody else yeah, is probably very, very difficult. Um, but... I don't know if there is a more melancholy piece of music mm -hmm. that has ever been written except for Barbara's Audagio for strings. Um, and so I'm sure, I'm sure it was disappointing. There's a story about um, John Landis talking to um, Elmer Bernstein, who did the score for American Werewolf in London. Mm -hmm. And he was really, really excited to write the piece of music for the transformation scene. And John Landis had to tell him, uh, no, I'm going to use a Sam Cooke song for that. And he, was, <laughs> he was really crushed by that. So, right. so I, I get it, but I don't know if the guy who wrote springtime for Hitler could write a song, could write a piece of music sad enough for the death of Joseph Merrick. Yeah. So, <laughs> So you kind of so it's, a, it's probably a lot of you know especially with composers, at least certain composers, certain musicians, mm -hmm. they don't like to be upstaged. It's not even that. I can, from a composer standpoint, if you are really or like it somehow like it somehow minimalizes their own contribution to the film by having somebody, somebody else's work in there with you. I don't even know if it's I don't even know if it's that. I think when from a composer standpoint, when when you know the music backwards and forwards to have something else come in mm -hmm. that's a different style and a different composer it can seem jarring and i think david lynch picked a decent piece for this it is it is a little jarring in the fact that it's so heavily recognizable yeah but unfortunately to most people classical music just sounds like classical music Unfortunately, and yeah. film scores just sort of sound like classical music to most people. So I don't think it was that terribly jarring. At least but John the, Williams came along. Well, even John Williams, you you know, I have gone and seen you know symphonies play his music. I mean, it's still. Yeah. Well, I know, but my that, point is, my point is, it made it more mainstream acceptable. Again. I suppose, yeah, I suppose that it wasn't just for because you know, that's when her, people st that's when people started getting a little geeky and nerdy about uh, s scores again. Right. Because there was a period where having a classical score that wasn't like, you know, a rock score, it was a major, it, it was a, it, it aged your movie is yeah. what the thought was at the right. time. Um, right. and, but the, but the thing is, you know, like I said, aside from the fact that I don't know if the guy who wrote springtime for Hitler could write something this sad, he mm -hmm. probably can. He's very, very good. He can do whatever he wants. But I think – He did get nominated that, for a Grammy Award, by the way, for, for this the soundtrack album. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing is there's something about this piece of music, about Barbara's Adagio for Strings, that is foreshadowing. And I'm wondering if that's part of why David Lynch used it because – even if 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 you know anything about that piece of music, 
it's one of the saddest pieces of music ever. And you know, I personally, in my opinion, you know he's going to die. Yeah. I mean, of course, everybody knows he's going to die. I mean, we all know the story. But if you didn't know the story of Joseph Merrick and how he died, and I'm sorry, what is the deal? They won't let him have mirrors, but they'll keep that stupid picture of a kid lying down in bed for him to look at and dream about all the right. damn time. Right. And he finally looks at it and he's like, you know what? I'm going to try sleeping, sleeping in a bed like a normal person. <laughs> no! <laughs> it's like it's like when Christopher Reeve pulls a penny out of his pocket. You're like, do not look at that penny. My God, I'm going <laughs> to... No, just don't. I'm going to lose my mind. Um, but it, it, the, it, it does book in the film, though. Um it, it does. It, it 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 does. But it brings it full circle because you know at first mm-hmm. when you when you're seeing um, those images and that music, listening to that music at the beginning of the film, yeah. you're not quite sure where we're going yet. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you're not. It, it's and, it, it's very Lynchian. Right. Right. But you know, once it, it and it's this is a piece of music that makes me cry whenever I hear it. Yeah. And. Like, I need to cry more in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because as soon as this music starts playing, I'm like, I'm, I am, I'm like yelling at the screen. Like it, like I do with, um, somewhere in time, like, do not look at the penny. Don't look at the penny. Don't look at the penny. Right. I'm like yelling at the screen, like, leave the pillows on the bed. Don't take the pillows off the bed. Don't take the pillows off the bed. Don't look at that picture of that little kid sleeping. It's not good for you. It's not what you need. So I love that you're trying to re- rewrite the movie that you've watched several times. <laughs> I'm not trying to rewrite it. I'm just yelling at it like please. Like like you're trying to change it through force and will. I just don't I just don't want it to happen. I don't want to I mean Joseph Merrick is such a sweet sweet human and so so grateful for every every kind word and kind action and right. So overwhelmed with emotion when he's when he's treated well and he has that. He has that he's line better, that I love. He's a better human being than the people trying to dismiss him as something less than a human being. He's a better human being than most human beings. <laughs> right. That's what. Well, that was but basically exactly, my point. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's a he's a better human being than the people who think they are better than him. Yeah. Um. He has that line where he says, "I am I am happy every hour of every day because I know I am loved." And if 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 we could all just be happy for that, we would all be happier. You could use a lot um, more of that in the world right now. Yeah, exactly. So to have to watch him die and to listen to Barbara Sondage <laughs> at the same time is like, it's like <laughs> call work and tell him I won't be in tomorrow. <laughs> I need to recover from this movie. It's, just, it's like, it's like so why can't you come to dinner, Sam? Because I watched The Elephant Man. <laughs> it's like that time that Chris came home. The movie Chris beat me home. up. <laughs> The movie, the movie made me in the sads. Like the time Chris came home to me sobbing, sobbing, blubbery, yeah, horrible right, sobs. Right. He's he's really worried, and he goes to hold me. He said, "What's wrong? What happened?" And I said, "I watched The Fly," and he like literally pushes me away. Like, why did you do that? Like, because he knows what you, the, what the effect it has you on know you. What, you know what's going to happen when you watch The Fly. Why did you do it? Yeah. <laughs> that's funny so but I mean I, I, I can see where he's coming from from a composer standpoint but at the same time I can see where David Lynch is coming from as well well obviously it worked the way that it was done so it turned it into eight possible possibilities for Oscar Gold that never happened <laughs> exactly so alright let's see what else uh, what having, do we, there's certain things obviously we haven't talked about yet about the movie mm-hmm. um, let's see so when Merrick gets to the hospital or is brought to the hospital mm-hmm. to prove that, you know, that Merrick can make some form of progress, Trees kind of uh, trains him to do some conversational sentences. You know, basically tries to rig the conversation a little bit for when Cargom comes in. For when Gom comes in. To make it look good, to make him convince him to, to let Merrick stay. Right. And he figure, he figures it out, but then – he hears Merrick uh, saying the Lord's Prayer. The 23rd Psalm. Yeah. The 23rd Psalm. And, oh, yeah, that's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the 23rd Psalm. Yeah. And he's like, wait, I didn't teach him this. And he's like, why didn't you tell me you could read? And, and he basically – You didn't ask. It's basically the answer. Yeah. yeah, you didn't ask me. Like, it's, it's never come up. Right. <laughs> so um, 
so the, and there were a lot of things that it it seemed that Treves was not asking. You know, like when he goes for tea with Treves' yeah. wife, and he's like, "Would you like to see a photo of my mother?" He's like, "Wait, you have a mother?" Like, yeah. <laughs> this, like of course he's got a mother, but. There are so many questions he hasn't asked him and so many things he hasn't. And there are people in the world that are like that, that you, they are not going to volunteer information. Why didn't you tell me you could do this? Well, because you never asked. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, there's, and they're stunned by how beautiful she is. Because, right. And like, it's considering like, OK, so how do we get from her to you? Right. Almost. And that was that was one thing also in the movie that was inconsistent. Because he has that he, he has that speech that makes Treves' wife cry, where he says um, that uh, he wasn't quite good enough for her, and he tried so hard to be good, and that's kind of not true because she she passed away when he was like twelve. Yeah, we talked. About, he was like I mean, eleven we, or. We talked about that. That yeah, apparently she died when she was eleven, and he right. started getting disfigured when he was twelve. And there is some conjecture that she had some form of disfigurement as well because of her – she had some sort of disfigurement or handicap or something like that. Okay. So, so, so it came from her side of the gene pool. It's not, it's not even that it came from her side of the gene pool, but it was more like it wasn't unheard of in that family, and that family was it, – it, 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 it was the father who was the jerk, I think. You know, she, she yeah. had – Well, obviously because you know, the, the way that – it shook out. Yeah, she had three children, and none of them lived into their. They either passed away as children or died died fairly young. So um, there really wasn't a, his his degenerative de- degenerative disfiguring disorder was not a problem for her because it was it hadn't really reared its head yet. So, um, and. Even the story of the elephant story, yeah, which was a – I don't want to say it was a medically accepted theory at the time called uh, maternal impression. Um, it was a theory that some people bought into medically, but they – but mostly it was a folklore thing that – if something happened to you while you were pregnant, it was going to imprint itself on your child. Like if you were walking through a graveyard at night and you saw mm-hmm. the devil, then your yeah. child would have horns or yeah, something like, that. It, like it was, that. Yeah. It was it was a way to explain your environment would affect the outcome of, of your development right. it, of your child. Yes. Right, exactly. If you were it it, it would somehow explain a deformity or disfigurement or of some other type of disability in your child. Like yeah. if, um, basically saying, well, he, the reason he's disfigured, disfigured or she's dif- disfigured is your fault. Because not, no, it. not even, not even your fault. Something happened to you. Okay. And then you had, and it's sort of like the mental imprint on your mind took a physical manifestation into your child because, if you know something like even even something mental like a schizophrenia, mm-hmm. it was if the mother had a bout of sadness during a pregnancy, like if she lost a family member or something and had a bout of sadness during her pregnancy, that's why her child has a has a mental issue. And in the case of of Joseph Merrick, the theory was that she went to a circus and was like attacked by an elephant, which is where the beginning of this movie yeah. comes from. You kind of see her thrashing back and where forth, and you see slow mo. Right, you see, right, you see the elephants, and those shots of the elephants are just gorgeous. Just yeah. the the sort of slow mo atmospheric ele- elephants, and Lin- you, can, Lynch's, you see one Lynch's, of them. Lynch is distorting their voices too, if you noticed. Right, right, and then one of them whacks her with his trunk. Yep. And that was the theory behind why he was the way he was. Yeah. And um, but that was not like I said that wasn't anything necessarily that manifested while she was still alive. Yeah. So it was something that was a theory that came later in life. Yeah, America believes though he personally believes that he must have been a disappointment to her. Right, and uh, but and it still, could, but he's still could, hopeful about how what she would think of him. Because he has such great friends, he is here. I am have with with such great friends and having in in such a lovely house and um 
and you know it's they don't really make it all that clear in this movie it almost sounds like he's not even sure she's she's passed right so when he did and like i said he did in fact have a horrible stepmother and horrible father that basically kicked him out yeah <laughs> so yeah. they don't really um address that and you know what good because those jerks don't deserve to be talked about frankly no they, no, they don't yeah. uh, one of the things i thought was interesting was uh, Mrs. Mother's Head calling out Treves because yes. – because and I thought that was a really good moment. I was glad it was in this film that essentially Treves is almost acting like – he's like the flip side of um, of uh, Mr. Bites. You know, in the way right. that he's, essentially he's kind of like in his own way in this in, – in trying to show off to his peers – by mm-hmm. by presenting Merrick and his condition to his peers and, and making him like this object of uh, societal fascination, that he's turned all, him it, into a sideshow yeah. under the guise of education. Right. So 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 essentially, yeah, it's 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 a it's a fancier way of essentially being what mm-hmm. Bites is a carnival barker. Right. And he gives her crap for it, but then he goes home and he's like, you know, am I a good man? What has this all been for? Why am I doing this? Yeah. And, but, but you could, but you could make the argument that, and, and Mother's Head does say some of these people, they come in and they, they look at him with horror. They don't look at him with the love that we look at him on. And and he's like, well, you know, weren't you like cold to him when he got here? And she's like, yeah, maybe, but I cared and fed I cared for and fed him, and now here I am. Yeah. And I, I get it now. She's basically saying, I get it now, and these people don't. They just want to show off to their friends that they saw the elephant man. Because not, um, not everybody is like Mrs. Kendall. You know, Mrs. Kendall is genuinely – has a, she genuinely has affection for him. Right. She finds him fascinating. She finds him sweet and kind and – just a, just a it does, it doesn't sweet, try, kind person. Doesn't try to use him. Doesn't try to use him, is not condescending. She's condescending a little bit in the sense that she is a celebrity and she has a little bit of that, like, oh, here's an autographed photo of myself, you know? Yeah. She's, <laughs> well, and, you know, she's, and she I also, guess she's full of herself more than she's condescending, but well, and she the, gets uh, over uh, it pretty quickly with him. And a little bit at the end of the movie when um, they, they essentially take um, – Trees and Mother's Head take Merrick to see one of her shows right. at the theater, and Kendall dedicates the, the performance to him. And, and he's sitting in, like, the royal box. Yeah, he's sitting in the royal box, and she yeah. has him stand up, and everybody you know, on the floor below applauds mm-hmm. and, and a standing ovation. And right. so, so she's kind of – she kind of makes him a little bit of a spectacle there. A, a, a little bit, but – but it, but she is trying to acknowledge him as well. But it's not like he's. You see where I'm coming from. It's it's I it's, do. It's a little self serving, but but you kind of overlook it because she's she's trying to do. You th- you want to believe she's trying to do something nice here. She's trying she's trying to do something nice, and it's more like um, this. You know, I'm dedicating this for my friend who loves the theater. Yeah, and he's never been able to see it, so this is his first time. It's almost like, it's almost like saying, um, "And let's give a round of applause for our writers tonight, or something." I mean, it's that yes. kind of a feel to it. It's not like he's in his nice, he's in his nice clothes. He's not like, you know, naked in front of a an like an arena of doctors right, exactly. <laughs> that are staring at him and prodding yeah. him and things like that. So it feels it feels a little bit different, I think. From give, her. Him, give, give him an extra dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You like, you like that young Frankenstein? We all know what he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly like that. Yeah, give him an extra dollar. <laughs> Nobody need him in the nuts. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Act on instinct. By the way, speaking uh, speaking of that scene, you know the guy that keeps – isn't it true, Dr. Frankenstein? Yes, you that the, guy. Yeah, that guy. Do you know who, do you know who that is? I, I, I can't remember his name, but I know I've seen him somewhere else. He's Brainy Smurf. That's right. That's it. Yes. Yeah. 
is Brainy Smurf. I did read that somewhere, but I completely forgot his name. Yes. It's like, to look yes. at him, you think he's like, he's like the discount store Bud Court, but he's Brainy Smurf. Yep. Yep. Yeah. He's no longer with us, by the way. He just passed. No, yeah, he just recently passed away. That's yeah. right. Um, but yeah, the, the the scene where Mother said is basically saying, you know, you're just doing the same stuff. You're just doing it under the guise of Yeah, and I was glad society. to see her calling him out like that. Right, and it, and it's and I'm and I I was glad to see that he took it to heart as well because he does initially like, hey, I'm the physician here. I know yeah. what's best for him. You know, he gets yeah. all well, you all pompous, all pompous, and yeah, yeah, exactly. Being the you know the elitist doctor that he is, mm-hmm. yeah, but it Surgeon. keeps him, it keeps him, yeah, it keeps him up at night. Yeah, so it's like turns out he oh hey he does have a conscience. Yeah, he's he's not. I mean, I, and that's I what dis, like, that's what differentiates him truly from bites is that he does have a conscience about it. He yeah, he does have a conscience. And I mean, I do feel like you know, society people in like eighteen eighty <laughs> can only can only be so enlightened. <laughs> Fair. But he was he was pretty good. I mean, they were they were lifelong friends, and they would have long conversations, and um, he was I, I think. Joseph Merrick talked, and I don't necessarily think he listened as well as he should have, right? Be- because his reminiscences are, are are incorrect. That he has he has some misinformation in there that he just sort of like just just his refusal to call him Joseph is just freaking weird. Yeah, it is weird. I agree. Yeah, I, I never really thought about how weird it is until you brought it up. But you're right. Yeah, it's just really weird. It's like why would you I, why would you like if you knew that why would you still call him something different unless he didn't like, know but i don't know i don't know how that works it's like it's like barry white says on the simpsons i know my own name <laughs> you know it, if the one thing that somebody could tell you about themselves that you couldn't argue with is their name right yeah okay uh is there anything else about this movie that we haven't covered that you want to talk well, about um Let's see. We talked a little bit about how David. Yeah, I, it, we kind of hit the highlights. I think. Well, I, it, I, there were also some scenes I feel that were very reminiscent of Eraserhead. Just some of those scenes in the streets of the industry where you know. Oh yeah, yeah. The, you, that, you, Lynch is totally yes because Lynch loves industrial sounds mm-hmm. and and visuals. So so you see a lot of like the workers slaving over these machines. And you hear the pumping and the grinding and the, yeah. the the steam whistles and it just it's you know it's almost like um, industrial porn as far as <laughs> David Lynch is concerned. You know, it's it's industrial it's, eraser head noises. It, it's just that he totally indulges himself. His industrial symphony number one, if you will. Yeah. It, what, for, yeah. There you go. Look that one up on Spotify, kids. Exactly. Um, so I, I he loves again, that I just, stuff. Yeah, he loves that stuff, and it's and it's David Lynch can find beauty in some of the ugliest things. You know, there's that there's that scene where um, the doctor is walking down the street, and there's a dog, and you know the dog is walking through poop, and it's you yeah. can smell how bad it smells. Right. But and as I was watching this, I was I I kept thinking to myself, I would love to see David Lynch do. A Jack the Ripper story. Yeah, that would have been good, wouldn't it? Because just of how well he does, you know, 1880s London, Mm -hmm. I think he would have done a very good job of it. And we know he doesn't pull any punches when it comes to the horrific. No. So by the time we get to Mary Kelly. Yeah. We're not, he's not, he's not going to, he's going to push that envelope to as far as people can stomach and still have. An R rating, I think. Yeah. And hey, it's not like he doesn't already have a background of um, films about murdering young women. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right? So, People murdering young hookers. Yeah, yes. it's not like he hasn't done that before. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, maybe he can remake From Hell. I don't know, but... <laughs> oh, see, now that's... That would be amazing because of the Joseph Merrick connection in From Hell. Yeah. I don't, and I don't know if anybody out there has read From Hell. Uh, if you haven't, you need to, like right now. Yeah. Um, but Alan, Alan Moore, Eddie Campbell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Joseph Merrick is in From Hell. He's in. He's part of that story. Yes, he is. And so, which is, 
my absolute favorite panel in that is um what's his name? Oh my god, what's his name? Ian Holm. What's his what's oh. the character name? Oh, I can't remember the character. Ah! It's been I, too long since I've read this book. I, I know. He he meets Joseph Merrick and he tells him that there are certain religions in the East, in the Mystic East, that worship the elephant. Oh, and that's so there, right. There would be some parts of the world where he would be worshipped. And I forgot about that. I can't. Oh God, this is gonna drive me crazy. But yeah, there's a there's a panel where there's two panels where one where the where where Joseph Merrick is just quiet, and then one where he's just by himself and he just says, "Worshipped." Like Sir William Gull, by the way. Yo, oh, thank you, God. You're welcome. It's gonna drive me nuts. But <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so David Lynch doing it from hell would actually have brought that piece Thanks, of I am, it. DB. Yeah, would have brought that piece of it into the into the movie, okay. which I I absolutely yeah it would have been I fascinating have... to watch that definitely mm-hmm. definitely. I've had a soft I've had a soft spot for Joseph Merrick since I was probably like seven years old. Yeah. When. For whatever reason, this movie was on TV, and I thought it was cool to watch it <laughs> when I was, like, seven. <laughs> you, you were just completely enthralled by it. I was completely enthralled by the concept of it, and I was fascinated by how this could happen to a human body. Yeah. You know, I had I had, I didn't know much about, you know, what what types of degenerative disorders were out there. But it was it was fascinating to me, and you know I'd already already knew who Anne Bancroft was, and I liked her, and so I was watching it, and then I just I I remember being a kid, and watching that scene where he's taking the pillows off, and just being like, he's gonna die, his head's too heavy, like it it yeah he's gonna kill he's killing himself essentially yeah he's essentially killing himself, and we we don't know. We'll never know if he did it on purpose or if he just wanted to try it out to see how it. But that—that's the theory see, the, that he the, wants. That's see. That's the vibe I got. That's one. Yeah. That's, that's some. That's a great way to kind of conclude this discussion. I think that the way I saw it was that he was at his happiest moment, coming back from that performance. He had right. his friends. He knew he was dying anyway, so he figured, well. I'm not going to be getting any better from this. This is it. I've reached my pinnacle. I finished my I finished my model of the church. I signed it. I signed my work. And mm-hmm. therefore, yeah. I'm ready to close out my life. Right. The way or, I the way I want to do it. There was part of me too that saw that, but then there was also part of me that said, "Well, I had this evening mm-hmm. where I dressed like a gentleman and I went to the theater and I did what everybody else does." Why can't I do what everybody else does? Let's right. let's try it. And yeah. and it failed. Yeah, obviously. Take the freaking drawings out of his room if you're not going to let him <laughs> near to. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm like I'm watching this going. Nobody thought that that might be a bad idea to keep in his room. Well, you know they they weren't as enlightened in the 19th century. Nobody I thought guess. that would give him some bad ideas. I mean, come on. Yeah. To be fair, is their first guy with produce. Yeah. No, that's true. So. All right. Oh yeah, seriously, Prady syndrome insanely rare, and it's and it's usually not diagnosed because it has to be like that bad for people to for people to diagnose it. It, it the, the more severe cases are the ones that are actually diagnosed. All right. So uh, unless you had anything else to talk about, what's your rating for this one? Uh, this one is a solid nine and a half out of ten. Solid nine and a half. What's the half point deduction? Uh, the amalgamation of the characters, I think, could have been done a little bit better. Like, maybe they could have used... Been more historically accurate? A little, a little more historically accurate with Bites, specifically. They could have used mm-hmm. Roper or Norman or, or any of those names. Um, yeah. could, have, could have been that amalgamation. But it's like, it, of all the characters you could have picked, or of all the historically accurate people you could have picked, I don't think you had to make somebody up because I mean, as you saw with Mrs. Kendall, they were able to amalgamate his relationships with women. They could have amalgamated his relationships with managers, but actually have the name of a manager. Yeah. So that, that's, that's where the, that's where the point five comes from. <laughs> okay. All right. I think that's uh, that's perfectly fair. I'm going to give this one a little less than you. I'm giving this one eight and a half out of 10 circus sideshow posters. Okay. Okay. 
because it's not my favorite David Lynch film because there oh, are I others give it that a I... Thing. Oh, yeah, it's, it's nine and a half cardboard cathedrals. Okay, there you go. That yeah. works. Yeah. That was my backup. Oh, so. nice. Okay. <laughs> That's good. So we're kind of thinking on the same lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just I, you know, there's other David Lynch films that I enjoy more than this one. I do enjoy this one. I think it's a very well-made film. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you've got a f- stellar cast. Yeah. It's hard to go you know any better than the cast here. And Lynch is just now figuring out what he wants to be as a filmmaker. Right. And showing that he's more than just that weird, surreal eraser head guy. And I think that's part of where my high rating comes from because yeah. David Lynch does have that reputation as being an inaccessible weirdo. Yeah. And I just want to like slam this eight Oscar nominated movie in their face and say, David Lynch can do whatever the hell he wants to. And it's going to be amazing. Here is my example. Yeah. And this is his second time out of the gate with a, Full length feature film with a wide release, and that, and, it, right. and this is what he does with it. And how many other top rated directors get nominated for best director and best film? Their second film out of the gate. Not even Steven Spielberg had that. Nope, nope. So there you go. All right, we don't have any Ghostwood mail, no Gmail. Oh, no Gmail. No Gmail. So uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Uh, it was a very stressful week for a lot of people, yep. and maybe some people just kind of decide to stop writing now that we're not talking X Files. Mm. But hopefully that's not the case. Yeah. So, but hopefully if you're like, hey, if you, we are going to be talking some more Elephant Man next time, which mm-hmm. I'll talk about here in a minute. So if you want to talk about, hey, your own experiences watching this movie, or your affinity for it, or anything else relating to David Lynch films, or uh, Twin Peaks, because, hey, we're a Twin Peaks podcast, right? Mm-hmm. Or anything else, drop us a line here at ghostwoodpodcast at gmail.com. Ghostwoodpodcast at the gmail. The gmail. Gmail. Oh, oh the gmail. Uh, you know what? I, after we're done, Charles, I'm going to look and see if they did their Halloween cartoon oh, yeah. this year. Strong Bad. The, yeah, the Strong the Bad Home Halloween. Star Runner. Yeah. Homestar Runner. Yeah. So you can reach us on Twitter at ghostwoodcast on Twitter. And, of course, Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast on Facebook. Zan, how about you? Where can they reach you? On Twitter and Instagram at Udenax19, Zan Sprouse on the Facebook. And if you want to hear me complain about what the Academy does wrong. Right. More ranting. <laughs> Longer rant. Ex- the extended cut rant. The extended cut. Yes. Next, uh, next time on... Gold Standard, the Oscars podcast, we will be discussing the one of the greatest upsets in the history of the Oscars, 1939. Mm-hmm. And so I'm complaining a lot about what didn't win in 1939 and what did win instead. So that <laughs> so would be check, Gone with the Wind, out. correct? That would be Gone with the Wind and not The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, yeah I would have gone with Gun- Wizard of Oz as well. Wizard of but... Oz. Um, so, yeah. yes, that would be uh, DJ Nick and Rachel Friend and myself discussing – the best picture for every year that there have been Oscars. And like I said, next time it'll be 1939. So we have a ways. Everybody check that out. We have a ways uh, to go before you talk to us, Charles, about. Uh, yeah. And then, Nick's to think about trying to bring me in for Bridge on the River Kwai, but in the 50s. Ooh, so. Did that win best picture? Yes, it did. Did it really? Okay. It did. Cool. So I could, I could tell him I could deal with that one because I, li- I li- really like that movie. That is the movie that got me watching. That, Sir Alec Guinness. That got me over my I don't like war movies hang up. Yeah, that's it. it was Bridge of the River Kwai. Mm-hmm. It's a really good one. All right. As for me, of course, at Charles Skaggs on Twitter, at Charles Skaggs on Instagram, Facebook, of course, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio, and my blog of Geeky Things. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot. See, we got some Twin Peaks in there somehow. Always. Always. Uh, where, of course, I talk about everything we talk about here on Ghostwood. So, of course, Twin Peaks and David Lynch films and X-Files and all kinds of comic book sci-fi goodness and news of my other podcasts for Southgate Media Group, including, hey, Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, which you're probably sick of me talking about Doctor Who on this on this episode. Hey, you know, you got a movie with a bunch of British people in it. Odds are good. This is true. You know, this is true. they're either going to have the actors have either been in Doctor Who or the Bill, one of the two, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or Law and Order Special Victims Unit. We'll <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, so so yeah, there's next up everywhere the Doctor Who podcast where we talk Doctor Who, Torchwood, Sarah Jane Adventures, 
joined, of course, by my partner in time, Jesse Jackson, and an assorted wonderful special guest companions, where last night Holly Mack joined us to talk Dragonfire, the very first Ace episode, which sadly Zan was not able to join us, but... Zan was ill. Zan was on the DL, the disabled list. Yeah, she was She was on the um, being murdered by her own head. Yeah, but I but I did express my hopes that we would get to talk Ghostwood tonight, and sure enough, hey, we did. So Heck yeah. uh, that's cool. That worked out pretty good. And the Phantom Zone podcast, where currently DJ Nick and I are talking The Boys Season 2, and we just did our third episode, not this week. So we got about, I believe, seven more to go, and it's been a lot of fun talking to the boys. Great show on Amazon Prime Video, so hope everybody checks that out. Stuck up on your fresca. Exactly. Lots of fresca. Did you hear that? Did you hear that episode? Oh, yeah. Where we, t- we were talking fresca? That's awesome. If you ever wanted to know about fresca, in case you're wondering, especially you people overseas. Mm-hmm. Fresca's delicious, by the way. Yeah. It's a, it's got a kind of a notorious reputation here, though. It does. It's a grapefruit soda, so, you know, it's a love it or hate it sort of thing. I personally love it. I'm okay with it. Love Fresca. I'm okay with Fresca. I'm okay with Fresca. It's delicious. And it's not my favorite, but I'm okay with it. And then Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, where Jesse Jackson and DJ Nick, uh, we talk Titans and Doom Patrol, but that's currently on hiatus. So I got some more free time. So maybe Zan and I could cook up something I don't know. in the meantime. I thought we could think of something we could do where we like, I don't know, watch movies and drink while we do it. That sounds like a decent idea. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. So watch this space, kid. I think that's an idea worth exploring. So maybe next week, maybe we'll have uh, something. Maybe we'll have something for you. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. So stay tuned, everybody. We're just going to be deliberately vague a little bit for just a little bit longer. So be one. good. Goodness sake. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. We got to get out of here. We got to get a judge. We got to call a judge or something. <laughs> this is what you guys can look forward to, but drunk. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if two hours of us kind of weaving around a movie and filling it, going all kinds of uh, directions and digressions, just picture that, yeah, with alcohol mm-hmm. on top of it, like Zan said. Mm-hmm. So. It's going to be good. Stay tuned. Next time on Ghostwood, we talk, hey, more of the Elephant Man, only this time in episode 88, we're talking the Elephant Criterion, meaning we're going to run down all the uh, Criterion Collection, Blu-ray special features, booklets, and and whatnot. Spoiler alert, buy this. Yeah. So I did like a page of notes already just to index everything we're going to have to go through as far as special features. Sheriff, we got a lot to talk about. There is a lot of material on this. I don't know if we're going to be able to cover it all because there's so much. And again, only got two weeks to talk to uh, go through all this. Well, we'll try and keep it. uh, We'll we'll try and we'll try and keep it uh, Reader's Digest version. Well, I'm going to probably try and prioritize stuff. So basically, I'm focusing on anything David Lynch, John Hurt, anything involving maybe the, you know, Mel, there's some stuff, interviews with Mel Brooks on this. So I definitely want to watch that because I'm a huge Heck. Mel Brooks fan. Heck yeah. And of course, uh, makeup artist Christopher Tucker. It's going to be mm-hmm. a lot of good stuff with that. So please come on back. I think it's going to be a lot of fun as we deep dive into the Blu-ray special features next time on Ghostwood. Zan, I had a ball talking Elephant Man with you. I was glad that we got to finally talk about one of your favorite David Lynch films. Yep, I was too. I had a great time talking with you about it, Charles. I apologize for the lack of structure, but, you know, sometimes that's how conversations work. Well, that's okay. I I try to be flexible in that regard. I don't try to be rigid about a structure. Obviously, I think that's kind of impossible anyway with this podcast. Well, it's a David Lynch podcast, so linear is not our thing. This is true. Sometimes organic just works better, I think. The spice must flow. The spice must flow, and he who controls the spice controls the podcast. So nicely done. Thank I, you. I don't think I don't think I get anything else to that. So everybody, <laughs> please come on back next time, episode eighty-eight, the Elephant Criterion, right here on Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Oh,